February 1945. For the last six years, Europe has been one vast battlefield. Millions of men are dead. But now, there is a certainty that Nazi Germany will be defeated, and the Allies are already looking to the future. Because it is now, as the battles still rage, that peace must be brokered. Therefore, Stalin, Roosevelt and Churchill decide to get together. The meeting takes place in a small resort in the south of the Soviet Union. It is here in Crimea that these three giants will together dream up the post-war world at one of the greatest conferences of all time, the Yalta Conference. This photograph is Yalta's memento of history. But what paths led to this moment? Why are the faces of Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin so tense? United in war, the Allies will show themselves to be at loggerheads in peace. For eight days, between the 4th and 11th of February 1945, the three greats will engage in a merciless struggle dictated by their opposing interests and ideologies. Yalta is the last time they will all meet. Each one of them is at a crucial stage of his own destiny, while this conference will soon plunge the world into a new darkness. February 3rd, 1945. After a seven-hour flight, British and American aircraft, which took off by night, land on the frozen runway of Saki Airport in Crimea. As he alights from the plane, Winston Churchill is stiff and has a raging fever. But the British Prime Minister puts on a brave face. Even unwell, he is ready to write a new page of history. U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt is also ready, despite his extreme fatigue. Diplomats and servicemen greet each other on the runway. Many of those present at Yalta keep logs. Thanks to their revelations, we know exactly what happened during the conference. Their writings tell the stories that the official history doesn't. Stalin has not seen fit to come and greet his guests at Saki. This absence is an early gambit in his power game. Negotiations are well and truly underway. It falls to Molotov, Stalin's faithful right-hand man, to meet Roosevelt and Churchill off the plane. Ravaged by polio, Roosevelt can no longer walk. Walking beside him, Churchill seems to be in a position of inferiority. This strange scenario is not lost on Churchill's personal doctor, Lord Moran, who protests in his diary. The Prime Minister walked alongside the President like an Indian attendant accompanying Queen Victoria's phaeton in old age. But this is not the last time that Churchill will appear to be Roosevelt's attendant. The war is not yet over, and the British Empire's glory is already beginning to fade. The USA and the Soviet Union are the century's new giants. Yalta will be Churchill's struggle for survival. Yalta is 150 kilometers from Saki, 
The journey takes no less than five hours because of the poor state of the winding road. A whole new ordeal begins for Roosevelt. He was paralyzed. So even in an automobile, he sat in the back seat with two cushions behind him here to, to give, to brace his back and some support for his legs, which were useless. Uh, and so it was a very difficult trip. With the war still ongoing across Europe, the road to Yalta is kept under close surveillance. 160 fighter planes patrol the sky. Roosevelt's daughter, Anna Bettiger, who is his traveling companion, is startled to observe how the Soviets operate. In her diary, she writes, All along the road from Saki to Yalta, soldiers were posted every 300 meters. Each time a car passed by, those without rifles saluted us. All of these Russian soldiers, women included, were smart and erect. Through the windows, Roosevelt and Churchill witness a scene of devastation. Crimea was won back from the Germans less than a year ago. Over 20 million Russians lost their lives. 70,000 Soviet towns and villages were destroyed. The USSR is profoundly scarred by the war, and Stalin himself has designed the itinerary so that his guests do not miss a single detail of devastation. This allows Stalin, very skillfully, to lay the burden of guilt on his two counterparts, mainly Roosevelt. We have lost many people, the subtext being that we've lost many people because you didn't come to help us. After an interminable five-hour trip, Roosevelt and Churchill finally reach Yalta in the early evening. Roosevelt is exhausted. His journey started 12 days ago when he crossed the Atlantic by boat before catching a plane from Malta. The American president has covered 8,500 kilometers, while Churchill has covered 3,200 kilometers. Stalin's journey by train was a mere 1,500 kilometers. It is as if there is some significance to the number of kilometers and that Roosevelt was prepared to make the greatest effort and Stalin the least. The Bay of Yalta has lost none of its charm. In the 19th century, it was a kind of Soviet Riviera where Tsars and aristocrats came to spend their holidays. The conference delegates would be put up in palaces that are still intact today. Before negotiations began in February 1945, they were completely refurbished. In anticipation of the conference, the palaces were very quickly refurnished with things brought from Moscow in great convoys in order to give them a homely feel. They'd been terribly neglected for a very long time. It was Stalin who decided to have the conference at Yalta, and he wanted to ensure that his guests had nothing but good memories. He greets them with opulence, reserving them the two finest villas. Livadia Palace for Roosevelt, where the negotiations took place. And Vorontsov Villa for Churchill. It is a clear night over Yalta. 
each of the big three gathers his strength for the coming marathon. February 4th, 1945, day one of the negotiations. Before the debates get underway, Stalin pays a courtesy visit to his guests. He starts with Churchill. The two men have not seen each other since they met in Moscow four months ago. They are pleased to see one another and take stock of the military situation. Stalin's reunion with Roosevelt is just as cordial. The Russian and the American share a martini, Roosevelt's guilty pleasure. And there's no lemon. Stalin makes a note of this, and the next time, he has a huge lemon tree delivered. This makes quite an impression on the British and the Americans because a lemon tree in the middle of the war is quite remarkable. They're dazzled. And at the same time, it shows off Stalin's power. Because in the field, Stalin is in a dominant position. Since the spring, the Soviet steamroller has been on the move, and the Red Army is regaining territory from the Germans. It's time for Stalin's war efforts to pay dividends. Negotiations finally begin at 5 p.m. The Lovadius Ballroom has been prepared for the conference. Everything is ready. Ministers and diplomats talk amongst themselves as they wait for the three great leaders. Churchill is the first to arrive with his daughter, Sarah. The prime minister is in good spirits and is wearing a Russian cap in tribute to his host. He feels better. After a good night's sleep, his temperature has fallen. Stalin is the next to arrive. In front of the cameras, the two men make a show of their camaraderie. Roosevelt is already at the negotiation table, having made a discreet entrance. This ritual will be repeated for the next eight days. He has banned cameras from filming his arrivals deeming them too humiliating. He has to get from that wheelchair into a chair, which is not easy when you are paralyzed from the waist down. Each of the big three has his advisors around him. They will not be negotiating alone. Churchill is accompanied by Anthony Eden, his foreign minister, along with diplomat Alexander Kadugan, an expert on Poland. Roosevelt leans on Harry Hopkins, his friend and right-hand man, the man he trusts more than any other, but also his foreign minister, Edward Statinius. Stalin also has two main advisors. Vyacheslav Molotov, his foreign minister, and the diplomat, Ivan Maisky. There are four large dossiers on the table. The fate of defeated Germany, that of Poland, the United Nations, and the war against Japan. The positions of the different Allied armies will have a significant influence on these dossiers. Since December, the Red Army has liberated Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, and Poland. The Russians are a mere 80 kilometers from Berlin. The Anglo-American forces, however, have been hampered by a German counterattack and are yet to cross the Rhine. You can certainly say, from a military point of view, the Soviets are clearly ahead of their Western allies. 
And that gives them the high ground from a diplomatic perspective. Added to this imbalance in the field, there is also an ideological disparity. Churchill and Roosevelt are two capitalists facing a communist. But this is not to say that they will present a united front to Stalin. Far from it. In fact, the two men espouse quite differing ideologies. Roosevelt appreciates Roosevelt respects Churchill as an old war horse who stood alone in Europe and admires this fellow who is still capable of remarkable performances. At the same time, he has a degree of contempt for him because he sees him as an old colonialist throwback, while he himself considers he has modern ideals, such as decolonization of the world. Roosevelt needs Stalin more than he needs Churchill. At this time, the U.S. is fighting a war against Japan in the Pacific. The battles are incredibly violent. And the Japanese have no hesitation in using kamikaze suicide jets against their foes rather than surrender. Without help from the Russians, the war could go on and on. Roosevelt also needs Stalin to participate in the future United Nations organization, which he's trying to assemble. Without the USSR, the UN will be just an empty shell. In order to move the project forward, Roosevelt is prepared to jettison Churchill, a long-standing ally, but with nothing to offer. Churchill takes this very badly. For him, it is a disaster to arrive separately in the knowledge that Stalin will fully exploit any divergence between the American and the Britain. The British Prime Minister suspects that Stalin will try to establish communist regimes in all of the countries liberated by the Red Army, and he knows that without Roosevelt's help, he will have no chance of stopping him. During the first day, only military matters are discussed. Each watches the others. As the tactical game begins, Stalin takes the lead. He suggests that Roosevelt preside over the plenary sessions. By being made president, he's being ingratiated, but also rendered powerless because he will be constrained to being master of ceremonies, during which time others will be able to plot and negotiate behind his back. This is a very clever ploy on Stalin's part. The first session was just a warm-up, with no significant decisions being made. But the Westerners are clearly aware that it will not be easy to make their voices heard against Stalin. So, Come the evening, each of them hones his strategy for the next day. Churchill ponders calmly, alone, gazing at the portraits of British aristocrats that Stalin has thoughtfully had hung on the walls for his enjoyment. Roosevelt develops his battle plan with Harry Hopkins. Day two, Churchill is once more first to arrive. While Stalin again is fashionably late. This time, serious matters will be discussed. The German question is to be debated. What will be Germany's fate once she has lost the war? How will the country be managed? What reparations will be appropriate? The Allies have differing positions on all of these questions. Discussions begin with the issue of Germany's imminent occupation. As early as 1944, the plan was that once conquered, the country would be divided and governed in three zones, American, British, and Soviet. But now, Churchill requests a fourth zone for France this time. 
He no longer wants to stand alone against these two giants who have something of an axe to grind with imperial powers. He wants an alliance with another colonial power. Finally, Stalin magnanimously says, the French didn't really fight much during the war, so we don't see why. They collaborated. They gave up very quickly in 1940. They don't deserve it. But I'm a reasonable man. All right, then. But you can share your own occupation zone with them. The concession costs him nothing, and Stalin cedes quickly. But he takes the opportunity to demand something from his allies in return. He wants the maximum reparations possible from Germany. The Soviet Union is ruined. The Bosch must pay. This vengeful attitude worries Roosevelt and Churchill. On this occasion, the two Western leaders stand fast. If Germany is pillaged and starved to appease Stalin, how can she be put back on her feet? It will inevitably be funded by us. So ultimately, we will be the one paying Stalin's reparations, which is clearly a bad thing. This refusal causes Stalin to dig his heels in. He's vexed and becomes suspicious. He's angry with his allies and becomes aggressive. Frankly, look me in the eye. Tell me, why do you not want the Soviet Union to be rebuilt? Is there some reason in the back of your Western minds why you would be against the legitimate reconstruction of our country? Why do you want to undermine us? First defiance, then the bluff. Stalin is about to play his trump card. And for that, he will need the support of his crony, Molotov. The two men form a peerless duo and are both masters of the dark arts of diplomacy. Molotov is the bad cop, Mr. Nyet. He's the one who isn't any fun and will be immovable on the more difficult issues. And the point where Stalin intervenes is when he smooths the waters, as if he's saying, you're going too far. You don't have to be so harsh. At this point, a total figure for reparations needs to be added to the German dossier. Nothing has yet been decided by the Soviet delegation other than a minimum and a maximum figure. In his journal, Russian diplomat Ivan Maisky describes the scene. Molotov, sitting to Stalin's right, leans towards him and asks in a worried tone, should I give them a total? Yes, give them a total, replies Stalin. Which one, five or 10? 10, snaps Stalin. It's a way of demonstrating that discussions are ongoing, that nothing has been finalized, and probably seems more reassuring for their counterparts across the table. 10 billion for the USSR. It's agreed. No one says anything. Stalin assumes that the total has been accepted. The Westerners haven't dared to react, but this decision will have severe consequences later on. Because Germany is incapable of paying such a vast sum, the Soviets will take payment in kind and dismantle Germany's industry. Following this first round of negotiations, each of the big three will retire to his palace to recuperate. As usual, Stalin buries himself in dossiers and prepares for the next day's debates. His office desk has been preserved exactly as it was then. In Livadia Palace, Roosevelt finds a little peace and serenity with his daughter, Anna. For the last few years, she has been his confidant and goes everywhere with her father. She was not only good company in the sense of a daughter, but she was very bright, aware, and informed. We were living in the White House so that she was, what should I say, like an assistant, not paid, very informal, but uh, what we would call in English a right-hand man. Fifteen kilometers away at the Voronsov, Churchill is with his daughter Sarah. The young woman is an actress and an auxiliary volunteer in the RAF. Churchill enjoys her cheerful presence at his side. 
The young women are delighted to be involved, and their fathers are happy to show off their daughters in uniform, showing that the whole family is taking part. And it makes a good impression on the entourage. And they can do those things that not everyone else can. For example, Churchill tends to get up late to work in bed, spends a lot of time in the bath. So you can't send an aide-de-camp to get him out. That would just be impossible. But you can send in his daughter. Most evenings that week, one of the leaders invites the others to supper. This is an occasion for more informal negotiations. The first of these meals takes place at the Livadia. The Americans take care of the service, but the Russians provide the food. And Stalin has made it a point of principle to make it sumptuous. These are 15, 30 course meals with caviar, cream, all kinds of things. Cream is rationed in Britain. People have virtually forgotten what it is. Meanwhile, the Soviet people are starving to death. But Stalin isn't interested in that. He only cares about showing off his power. This is Georgian and Russian hospitality. I'm your host. I will do anything for you. You only have to ask. Psychologically, this gives him the upper hand. I am both your master and your servant. It's marvelous, both marvelous and menacing. Everything is dependent on Stalin's goodwill. That is one of the defining aspects of Yalta. In order to make sure his guests feel at home and well disposed towards him, Stalin has thought of everything. At supper, the alcohol flows freely. It's a well-known fact that if you want successful negotiations, you want the delegates to be at their ease. So food and drink have always been part of the means at the hosting power's disposal. This is a game in itself, seeing who can drink the most. By which I mean that alcohol clearly played a part at Yalta. The first supper brought the Allies together. A new sense of trust emerged. Negotiations began in a fresh atmosphere. To allow everyone to recover from these bibulous evenings, the plenary sessions were planned for late afternoon. But Stalin, Roosevelt and Churchill's cohorts spend their morning working on preparation for the debates. They ponder the possible compromises for each dossier. It will then be left to the big three to thrash it out. On day three, February 6th, the Polish dossier is on the table. This is the prickliest part of the conference yet. It is also the most symbolic, as it was in Poland that the war began. The Allies must set up a new government. But they are unable to agree on anything. Stalin has always considered Poland a threat to his country. Because throughout history, it has always been through Poland that Russia has been invaded. Therefore, Stalin wishes Poland to be a friendly state. In fact, he wants to build a defensive buffer all around the Soviet Union so that she'll never be attacked again. The Soviet Union would ha have those as buffer states. That was understood. And it was understood that for the Russians, that was an essential part of their foreign policy. And when you think about it, uh, you wouldn't want, if you were a big state like the Soviet Union was, to have a hostile state right on your border. No, you would want a friendly state. But what does a friendly state mean? Is it a country whose foreign policy is friendly towards the Soviet Union and whose domestic policy is completely free? 
Or is it a country whose friendliness will be co-opted into communization? That's the big question. The British view is that they certainly did not declare war against Hitler over Poland in order for it to become a communist state. Churchill wants post-war Poland to be free and independent. The British had a long tradition of a friendly Poland. The British had a long-standing trading agreements, economic agreements, and they did not want to have a country as big as Poland with its natural resources and human resources uh, under the influence of communism if they could help it. For Roosevelt, far removed from Europe, the Polish question is incidental, but it still has some importance for other reasons. Six million American citizens are of Polish extraction, and these citizens mostly support Roosevelt's Democratic Party. So he is very conscious of the potential situation in Poland. These Polish citizens who took refuge in the U.S. are fervent anti-communists. Most of them came to America before the First World War, but they've never forgotten that Stalin and Hitler were in accord over the invasion of Poland. These Polish Americans, along with the British, support Polish President Władysław Rakiewicz, who has been in exile in London since 1940. Problem is that another government, communist this time, opposes him. This Soviet-influenced government is headed by Bolesław Bierut. It has its headquarters in the center of Poland at Lublin and calls itself the Lublin Committee. The London and Lublin governments detest each other. Six months ago, an event took place which damaged their relationship beyond repair. August 1944. At this point in time, the Red Army is at the gates of Warsaw. From London, Rakovich decides to trigger an insurrection. He wants the Polish resistance to liberate their capital before the communists do, to give him the upper hand in the future government. But the German repost is ferocious. For 63 days, the resistance is relentlessly crushed. Stalin coldly allows this to happen and orders the Red Army to do nothing. The Nazis massacre 200,000 Poles. 90% of the Polish capital is destroyed. Two months later, Stalin reaps the benefits and installs a communist government in Warsaw. Stalin's actions cast a pall over the Yalta negotiations. Churchill has never been able to stomach the fact that Stalin let the Warsaw insurgents perish without coming to their aid. At this point, he understands that he's not dealing with some avuncular good chap, but that he could not be fully trusted and was actually a dangerous hoodlum. And finally, that even if Hitler had to be removed first, they would have similar problems with Stalin after the war. But now in Yalta, the Allies must put suspicion and rancor aside and build Poland's future government. The speculation is over which political model it will be based on. Obviously, the Anglo-American point of view is that they should build a united national government from Poland's different anti-fascist political groups. 
The Soviets and Stalin see it simply as a matter of using the Warsaw government as it is, with the addition of a few members. A political arm wrestle ensues. Stalin does not want to hear about the London-based governments. On the other hand, each time Churchill or Roosevelt try to compromise by suggesting potential members to bring into the Lublin administration, he refuses. And why would he agree? Stalin knows he is in a position of strength. The Soviet Union troops were in those countries, <laughs> occupying those countries, although the word occupy is not uh, used, but nevertheless, they were there. And there, you know, it's uh, the Soviet Union influence, you can, in hindsight, you can say, was inevitable. The Allies cannot find a way to agree. And little by little, things become heated. Stalin becomes increasingly agitated. At his side, Ivan Maisky is petrified. He describes the scene in his diary. Suddenly, Stalin got up and started gesticulating with his right arm. Such behavior was inappropriate for a conference of the big three. He started talking in an unusually overwrought manner. Stalin is a very taciturn and calm character, other than on a few occasions when he gets very angry. These occasions have a mounting influence on the debate. The fact that he will suddenly stand up and launch an impassioned tirade on a certain subject is a very clear way of showing his counterparts that there are matters on which he's not prepared to compromise. The Soviet leader's tirade floors his allies. Hopkins, who witnesses the debacle, slips a note to the presiding Roosevelt. Why not end this here for the day? Let's say we'll talk further tomorrow. It's 7.15. Better to leave things as they are and start afresh the next day. The skill with which Stalin negotiates is obvious to everyone. Uncle Joe, as the Westerners know him, has a hypnotic hold over the delegations. In his room that night, the diplomat Alexander Cadogan writes, I must say I think Uncle Joe is the most impressive of the three men. He's very calm and reserved. When he speaks, he never uses a superfluous word and gets straight to the point. The British Secretary of State, Anthony Eden, is no less impressed. By more subtle methods, he got what he wanted without having seemed too obdurate. However, Stalin's success cannot merely be attributed to his negotiating talents. In fact, unknown to Eden and Cadogan, Uncle Joe's apparatchiks had been spying on his allies. Before the altar conference even begins, he knew everything that was going on. No Preparations for the altar conference lasted several months. At the time, Russian information services were well implanted in England and the USA. Our agents were providing us with exhaustive details of how Churchill and Roosevelt were preparing for the conference. We knew exactly what they were planning to discuss and on which positions they were going to stand firm during negotiations. To ensure they did not miss a thing, the Russian Secret Service had also bugged the palaces. Churchill and Roosevelt knew this. What they didn't realize, a little naively, is that when they went to the park to discuss confidential matters, everything was being picked up by multi-directional microphones, which were everywhere. They were in the trees, the bushes, and they capture any conversation in a radius of several meters. Stalin does not treat this information lightly. He does not want to miss a shred. He even insists that his spies personally report back to him everything they've heard. On 
Stalin wanted to know how things were said. He even insisted that dialogues were repeated using the same intonations that Churchill and Roosevelt had used. The cards used in the Yalta poker game are marked. Stalin knows exactly what hands his opponents have. He knows exactly where he's heading, while his allies are feeling their way around in the dark. Day four of negotiations, and the Polish dossier needs to be finalized. Thanks to the information gathered the previous day, Stalin knows that his allies are prepared to sacrifice Poland in order to get what they want from other dossiers. The UN and Japan are uppermost in Roosevelt's mind. The dossier Churchill cares about most is not on the table at Yalta, but is an underlying issue. It's Greece. Greece is a former British protectorate. It is an important strategic asset for the British as Greece opens the path to the Suez Canal, which gives them access to their colonies. But for the last two years, Greece has been in the throes of a violent civil war. The communists are trying to overthrow the king, control the countryside, and are on the verge of taking power. If Greece were to fall to the communists, the future of the entire British Empire could be at stake. Churchill dreads this terrible scenario. In order to avoid this, he makes the first move and becomes embroiled in perilous bargaining. In October 1944, four months before Yalta, the British Prime Minister meets Stalin face to face in Moscow. At the time, Roosevelt is in the midst of a re-election campaign. Churchill uses the opportunity of the American president's absence to forge a secret pact with Stalin over Europe's future. So when we talk about dividing up the world, it wasn't done at Yalta, but when Churchill and Stalin met in Moscow. The document, scribbled on a scrap of paper in Churchill's hand, is annotated by Stalin. Like two grocers, they have mutually agreed their shares of the East European crop. Russia gets 90% of Romania. The Soviets get 75% of Bulgaria. Britain gets 90% of Greece. When he gets to Yalta, Churchill is hoping that Stalin will remember this agreement. In order to ensure the Soviet leader leaves him a free hand in Greece, the British Prime Minister is prepared to hang Poland out to dry. This agreement on percentages is in sharp contrast with the idea of an immovable Churchill. He would never have agreed to compromise on any European zones or spheres of influence. To avoid upsetting Stalin, the Western powers end up being conciliatory on the Polish question. On the fourth day of negotiations, the American and the Briton drop Rakovic's government in exile and recognize Bierut's communist Lublin government. In exchange, Churchill and Roosevelt win places for non-communist ministers in the Lublin government. Stalin also commits to organizing free elections in post-war Poland, as well as in all of the other countries liberated by the Red Army. The phrase, free elections, sounds like a victory for the West, even though Stalin has given them no guarantees whatsoever. All they managed to get from Stalin was a declaration of good intentions, and formulas which would allow them to save face in their respective parliaments. They only just managed that. But what more could they do? But how were free elections conceivable when the country was completely occupied by the Red Army? This is where the Western leaders were deluded. 
For in exchange for these promises, the Western leaders have done Stalin a huge favor. They allow him to construct a defensive buffer by attaching part of Poland to the Soviet Union. In return, Poland will, at a later stage, gain German territories, allowing the country a gradual transition to the West. Stalin has got full marks for the Polish dossier. The Soviet leader has got everything he wanted. His allies hope that he will not forget this. It's February 8th, and the sun shines brightly in the Crimean sky. Roosevelt is on edge as the discussions are about to begin about Japan. The American president desperately needs Stalin's support. To make sure things go in his favor, he invites Stalin to share a martini just before the plenary session. Churchill has not been informed of this tryst, and the meeting takes place behind his back. Roosevelt is afraid that the impetuous Englishman will stop him negotiating freely and upset the apple cart. The US president is also a great believer in heart to hearts. He believed in having a personal rapport with Joseph Stalin and I think FDR felt that he could have influence on Joseph Stalin with a rapport that he was developing. But such things do not work with Stalin, no. He had no idea how cruel Stalin was, how devoid of human sentiment he was. At this time, the American campaign in the Pacific is suffering heavy losses against the fanatical Japanese army. The top brass estimates that without Russian help, the war could last for another year and cost the lives of more than half a million GIs. Roosevelt is determined to avoid this bloodbath. Stalin knows this and raises the stakes. In return for Soviet cannon fodder, he wants territory and he is greedy. He demands Sakhalin Island and the Kuril Islands, but also control of Port Arthur, Dairen, and the Manchurian Railway. Negotiations don't dwell on Kuril and Sakhalin, as they belong to Japan. And the Americans are more than happy to hand over Japanese territory to the Soviets. But Dairen and Port Arthur are troubling because they belong to China. China means Chiang Kai-shek and he's an ally of the US. And he wasn't invited to Yalta. So, Roosevelt could be censured, notably by the Senate, for making concessions to Stalin to the detriment of an ally. It's a very delicate situation. But then Stalin, in his turn, tries to mollify Roosevelt. He will use his charm to find a solution and convince Chiang Kai-shek to accept the situation. Roosevelt's interpreter, Charles Bolin, reports in his memoirs. Stalin said that it was clear that if his conditions were not met, it would be difficult for him and Molotov to explain to the people why the Soviet Union was entering the war against Japan. It was obvious that Roosevelt was bothered by what he was doing. Roosevelt wavers, but faced with Soviet intransigence, swallows his scruples. His main aim is to bring this war to an end. His Chinese allies are sacrificed, along with Dairen and Port Arthur. He'll sort things out with Chiang Kai-shek once the war is over. The American president can be pleased with himself. He has achieved his objectives not just over Japan, but also the UN. The new organization which Roosevelt wants to see harbors the ambition of bringing peace to the world. 
Stalin has agreed in principle to be a part of this peacekeeping organization. The USSR's de facto participation is far from in the bag. But it is a start. It's quite a coup to get Stalin to admit that he'll send Molotov to Dumbarton Oaks for preliminary negotiations. For Stalin, this is a big concession. And Stalin keeps saying, so this UN thing of yours, can I really send Molotov? I'm not sure. He's playing a game of cat and mouse, and he's good at it. Day six of negotiations. On February 9th, 1945, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin can display their good humor for the throng of photographers. The UN, Japan, Germany, Poland, the big three have managed to reach compromises on each of these dossiers, and each of them has come away with what they wanted the most. Churchill has proved himself the equal of his two powerful counterparts and has hoisted France into the realm of the victors and got them an occupation zone in Germany. The American president has got a green light from Stalin over the UN and Japan. And along with Churchill, he has also got Stalin to agree to organize free elections on Poland and Eastern Europe after the war. But it is the Soviet leader who hits the jackpot. Without question, it's the Soviet Union and Stalin who come out on top in the Yalta Conference. Stalin has got what he wanted regarding Poland and pretty much what he wanted regarding Germany, certainly where reparations are concerned. This image of perfect harmony between the big three goes around the world. But the image is deceptive. At Yalta, Stalin, Roosevelt and Churchill made a point of trying to get along. They wanted to preserve the alliance while the war was still going on. But ultimately, each of them defended his own world vision and his own interests. The Yalta agreements are precarious. They are born of compromise and rest upon a fragile unanimity between three exceptional characters. However, Come the end of negotiations, everyone wants to believe. That evening, the delegations drink toasts to friendship between nations and peace for all humanity. But this hope will be short-lived. This Entente, celebrated by the Big Three, will soon shatter. A mere three weeks after the end of the conference, Stalin rides roughshod over the Yalta agreements. With the Red Army still occupying Romania, he organizes a power grab by the communists. In Poland, every time his allies put forward the name of a non-communist minister to join the government, Stalin declines. The hitherto confident Roosevelt becomes anxious. Post Yalta, Roosevelt became disillusioned. He realized that the Stalin he thought he knew bore little resemblance to the real Stalin. On April 1st, the American president sends a long telegram to his friend Stalin seeking explanations. I cannot conceal from you the concern with which I view the development of events of mutual interest since our fruitful meeting at Yalta, events in which our common interests were at stake. I frankly cannot understand why the recent events in Romania should not be regarded as not falling within the terms of that agreement. But Roosevelt's warnings fall on deaf Soviet ears. Stalin ruthlessly follows through with his plan and keeps installing communist regimes in Eastern Europe. Roosevelt dies 11 days after sending the telegram, never to see the full extent of Stalin's betrayal. 
Churchill, who to widespread shock loses the general election, can only sit powerless and watch their master plan unravel. The big three did not bring long-awaited global peace into the world at Yalta. The dream of brotherhood was nothing more than an illusion. Soon, these former allies would be enemies, fighting a new kind of conflict, the Cold War.